The process of making a protein is called translation, and it's kind of like a beautiful molecular dance that's taking place inside of a giant complex of proteins and RNA called the ribosome. And this dance is so beautiful, and it's really, really accurate. It only makes like one mistake in 10,000 or so amino acids, and it does so because it's paying the cost to make sure that only the right tRNAs bring the right amino acids to be added, and that only the right amino acids are actually added. And so these amino acids are going to be the individual building blocks of the protein that the ribosome is piecing together based on the instructions in the messenger RNA. And the ribosome has these three main sites, these kind of rooms, the E, the P, and the A. So the P is the peptidyl site, um, that's where the growing chain is going to be held, but when the a new tRNA comes and brings the next amino acid in the A site, basically the arrival site or the amino acyl site. This is where that amino acyl tRNA is going to come in and it's going to be holding that amino acid that needs to be added next. The ribosome is going to kind of help egg it on so that it attacks the growing chain and this way the growing chain gets transferred to that new, that incoming tRNA. And now it's going to be a really awkward shape and so with the help of some um, elongation factors and some GTP, it's gonna kinda like shift over. And when it shifts over, well now it's gonna push that, what was holding the chain into the E site. And this E site, this like exit site, basically what's gonna happen here is that tRNA is gonna fall out. And now your chain is in the P site again and you have an empty A site. And this empty A site is where the next tRNA is going to come and it's going to come in holding the next amino acid. And it's going to come in like all of these are coming in with the help of an elongation factor. It's kind of like a chaperone. It's going to help make sure that the right tRNA is being brought and that it's like actually the right one before it's going to spend some GTP and leave. So you have GTP being paid in the cost of bringing the new amino acid, waiting to make sure that it's actually the right one, and then it'll spend that energy. Now you have to spend more energy in another elongation factor in order to squish things, push things over into the, um, into the P site. And you're going to be spending energy when you're actually loading that tRNA, so when you're actually putting the right amino acid onto the tRNA. And so thanks to all of these things, your ribosome doesn't have to worry about actually having proofreading activity. So it can't like erase, it can't go backwards. Like your DNA polymerase and your things like this that are making copies of DNA, they can proofread um, and so they can actually like go backwards and fix things. Your protein making machinery can't do this. It's not as big of a deal though if you make a mistake in making a protein versus making a mistake in your DNA because the protein is just a single copy and so if you make a mistake in one copy, it's not like it's going to influence things really that much. But if you make a mistake in your DNA, well now you can pass on a mutation. And so, but the ribosome still wants to be making good proteins, right? And so in this way, we're spending a lot of energy in order to piece together these amino acids in to make a protein. And so the whole process is really, really cool. And so the ribosome is going to go along. It's going to keep adding together all of these amino acids. It's going to get to what we call a stop codon, basically a signal. It's going to tell the ribosome to stop making that protein. And so it's going to stop making that protein. And what's going to happen is instead of a new tRNA coming in with the next amino acid to be added, you're going to get a release factor come in. And the release factor, what it's going to do is it's going to, instead of egging on the tRNA to attack, um, it's go or the amino new amino acid to be, to, that was attached to the tRNA to attack is going to kind of like egg on water to attack. And so water is going to attack this growing chain. And when you get water attacking that growing chain, the growing chain is going to be um, released. And so you get this released and then you have all these other factors come in and kind of help the ribosome like come apart, uh, come off the mRNA. And so it can be used again for new messenger RNAs and things like this. But basically translation is this really, really awesome process. Um, and so I want to tell you about it in a little more detail. So I'm not going to go into much detail in terms of the background and the messenger RNA. I have lots more posts on that, and I want to dive more and focus on, this, on the process of translation. But it's important to realize that what the ribosome is doing, it's doing based on a messenger RNA template. And this messenger RNA template is going to be an edited RNA copy of a DNA gene. And so this messenger RNA is going to have the instructions for which amino acids to add. And then a tRNA or transfer RNA is going to bring the corresponding amino acid.
and how these amino acids are specified are by these three kind of letter words or these three. Um, so the messenger RNA can be read in these three letter wor words called codons. And basically a, the tRNA with the matching amino acid is going to come and it's going to have a complementary anti-codon. So tRNA is like the name said, just it's an RNA. And so it kind of has these three um, RNA letters, these three um, nucleotides sticking out that are going to match or complement the messenger RNA. And this in this way is going to help the ribosome be able to add the right amino acid assuming that the tRNA is charged correctly. And so we're actually going to see how we spend money to charge the tRNA because ribosomes, as much as I love them and I really, really love them, they're not that smart. They're only going to be able to tell if the codon and anti-codon are complementary. They're not going to be able to tell whether the right amino acid was actually attached to that tRNA. But assuming that all goes okay, the ribosome is then going to be able to add these amino acids in the correct order. And then they're going to be able to, as the ribosome is piecing them together, they're going to be kind of pushing the older ones out of the chimney. And then those are going to fold up based on the properties of those amino acids to give you a pretty, pretty protein. So in a little more detail, let's look at how this is actually happening in the ribosome. And so first let's look at ribosomes themselves. So here's an example of ribosomes. Um, this is actually going to be drawn in backwards from how I'm showing this. So this is showing the ribosome has these three sites, the E, the P, and the A that we'll get into. And this is showing it in kind of the APE order. But ribosomes are made up of this large subunit and a small subunit. And so the large ribosomal subunit or the LSU it's going to have the peptidyl transferase center. So that's where we're actually gonna get the pass off from the nascent chain. So from the growing chain in the P site to the incoming amino acid tRNA. So in the, to the A site tRNA. This is gonna be happening in the PTC, the peptidyl transferase center, which is in the large subunit. And then the small subunit, this is where you're actually going to have the tRNA binding to the mRNA and we call it the decoding center, which is where it's like the check place, like does the codon match the anti-codon? So that's gonna be in the small ribosomal subunit. And so you need both of these together in order to form a functional ribosome. So note that in prokaryotes, so like bacteria and archaea, your full ribosome is gonna be your 70S and it's gonna have a 50S LSU and a 30S SSU or S yeah. Um, and basically, the S refers to these things called Spellberg units, which relates indirectly to the size. It's basically based on the sedimentation rate, which is if you spin these things down, how fast do they sink in like a gradient? Um, and so it's not directly additive, which is why 50 plus 30 might equal 80, but 50S plus 30S equals 70S. If you're talking about 80S, well, now you're talking about a eukaryotic ribosome, so like plants, animals, and fungi. And these are made up of a 60S LSU and a 40S SSU. Um, so just if you come across these terms, that's what they mean. And basically each of these is going to be made up of a bunch of proteins and RNAs. And so although we often think about enzymes or reaction helpers as being proteins, they can also be RNA. And in this case, they're RNA protein complexes. And the bulk of the hard work is actually being carried out by the RNA. So within this ribosome, you're going to have these three sites, the E, the P, and the A. The P site, the peptidyl site, this is where their growing chain is going to be held. The A site, this is like um, amino acid site, or I like to think of it as kind of like the arrival site. This is where the incoming tRNA is going to come, holding the amino acid that's going to correspond to the anti with the anticodon that corresponds to the codon that is now in this A site. And so the A site codon is going to be the one that's going to be kind of like being read when the new tRNA comes in. You're going to get the pass off as we'll see. And then we get, um, we have the piece that one is going to get kicked into the E site, this like exit site, where it's going to then be able to like fall out. And so you have the E, the P, and the A site. Most of the time, the tRNA is going to be coming in the A site. The only exception is when you have the initiation. So before, in order to get things started, you have to have the 
like one of them has to be first. And that first one's going to, therefore, your peptide is only going to be one, and it's going to be in the P site, though. And so everything's going to kind of have to form around that initiator tRNA in the P site. When I talk about this initiation, basically it's important that the ribosome knows where to start and that it starts at the right place. Because if it starts out of frame, basically those codons are non-overlapping. So if it starts in the wrong place, you can kind of get all the letters be off. To make things even harder for the ribosome, although there is a start codon, there is a codon that tells the ribosome this is where to start. It only does that sometimes. And so the start codon is AUG, which is actually also the codon for methionine. So it's a codon for one of the amino acids. And so if the ribosome is already in the middle of like making a protein and it comes across an AUG, that's just gonna, it's just gonna put in a methionine as usual. But a methionine, this codon can also be a methionine and a start codon, meaning that yes, the ribosome does put in a methionine, but it also starts a new chain at that at that site. And so how does the ribosome know where to start? It gets signals from the part of the messenger RNA that's actually not part of the codon coding region. So it gets signals from the part like upstream or like before that actual start codon. So messenger RNA, this mRNA is basically an edited version of the gene. It's part of the editing involves removing regulatory information. So these like intron regions that are in between or like interrupting the exons, the parts with the actual protein making instructions. And so you have a part of the messenger RNA that has all the instructions, all those codons that are going to tell the ribosome at this, 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 and this. But then you also, at the ends, you have these untranslated regions, these UTRs. So you have the 5 prime UTR and the 3 prime UTR. And the 5 prime UTR, this like kind of beginning sequence, this like front matter, it's going to have information that's going to help the ribosome know where to start. You also have help from, in at least in the case of eukaryotes, we have this um, like a, a cap on the five prime end, which is going to bind to various initiation factors and help the complex get formed, help the initiation complex get formed. And then you have various RNA sequences and things like this that are going to help the ribosome know where to start. But you can still also get like alternative start sites and things like this, which can give you different proteins from the same gene. So it's kind of complicated and people are still trying to work out all of the details. But basically, when the ribosome, somehow these initiation factors are going to help the ribosome get situated in the right spot where you have that initiator tRNA, which remember is also going to hold a methionine, it's going to be in the P site. In bacteria, this they actually use like a special um, methionine that in the initiation, it's going to be kind of like a modified version. But anyway, you have that happening and every, now everything is arranged at the P site. Oh, and so uh, really important to mention, though, is that basically what's going to happen is that the whole ribosome doesn't get assembled until it, the, the small subunit kind of finds the right place. So the small ribosome subunit is kind of going to get recruited by those initiation factors that the signals and the cap and things like this help recruit. And then what's going to happen is once the small subunit finds the right place, you're going to get the large subunit brought in and you're going to get everything assembled. And so now we have everything assembled, you can get that full ribosome and you can get translation happening. So remember the decoding center where the tRNA needs to match the messenger RNA that's in the small subunit. So you're able to kind of find that start site and then bring in the large subunit, which has the peptidyl transferase center. And so it's actually going to be able to do that transfer of the chain. Before we even get this translation going, we're going to be spending energy. So anytime you see like GTP or ATP, this is going to tell you that you're spending energy. And so what I mean by spending energy we often talk about ATP as being like the universal cellular currency, but for translation, we actually use GTP. In both of these cases, what we're talking about is breaking what we call high energy bonds. They have high chemical potential energy. Just like the ball at the top of the hill has high like kinetic potential energy, chemical bonds have high chemical potential energy and in some cases. And basically, the more uncomfy a bond is, the more potential energy it has. If you think of these phosphate groups, the triphosphate, you have these three negatively charged groups that are held closely together 
negative charges repel one another. And so this is going to be really uncomfy, it's kind of like a clamped spring. Now, if you were to break it, kind of like unclamping the spring, well, now you're going to be relieving some of that uncomfiness. When you relieve uncomfiness, you release energy. So kind of like if you had a ball at the end of your spring and you release the clamp spring, the ball would fly across the room. If you have a triphosphate bond and you break that bond, now you release energy that you can use to do things like get um, molecules to join together in ways that might not be energetically favorable and things like this. We often use ATP, but in translation, you actually see GTP be used a lot. Um, and so we'll get more into this later. But GTP is just like ATP, except this part is different. But same, the phosphate groups are the same. And so you get that same, um, that same energy boost when you break one of them. And we're going to use a lot of energy to make sure that we have the right amino acids being added. Overall, we're going to see that we kind of spend about four, amino, four triphosphates per peptide added. Um, as well as we're going to spend energy for that initiation phase and the um, and the termination or like when we're actually recycling the ribosome and things like this. So we'll get back to this. For now, let's go and look back at what happens once we have things assembled. Once we've done that initiation step and we have things assembled with the tRNA, with the initiator tRNA in the P site. So in this case, you wouldn't have the chain here. You would just have a single amino acid. But similarly to what happens when later in, when you're making the chain, you're going to have an empty A site. When you have an empty A site, you're going to have a codon exposed in that A site. And that codon is going to then um, be open to pair with a tRNA that has a matching anticodon. And so you have all these tRNAs floating around, but only the ones with the matching anticodon are actually going to be able to like stick if they float in there. And so if they float in there and they stick, what's going to happen is that the ribosome is going to be able to catalyze the transfer um, to get it to be added to the chain. But the tRNA doesn't come alone. It comes with the help of an elongation factor, which is going to help make sure that it's actually the right one. It's not just sticking in there accidentally. And so these elongation factors, in the case of bacteria, it's F2. In the case of humans, it's EEF1A. Um, so E for like eukaryotic elongation factor. Um, and so basically what it's going to do is it's going to make sure that the tRNA and codon and anticodon match. This is really important because that's the only way that the ribosome knows what, what to add. Um, and so we'll talk later about how it's important that the tRNA be loads, loaded correctly, but it's also important that the right tRNA, um, that at least the anticodon codon part matches. And so this elongation factor that kind of helped bring in that tRNA, it's going to stick around until it makes sure it's the right thing. And then it's going to um, spend GTP. So it's going to break one of those GTP bonds to form GDP and then fall off. Basically, this elongation factor, when it does that breakage, it, that breakage, the energy from that is used to kind of lead to a conformational change or kind of like a shape shift in this elongation factor. And now the elongation factor goes from liking to bind to the, um, to the ribosome to not liking to bind. And so once it not, doesn't like to bind anymore, it's going to fall off and then it can be regenerated. It can get a GTP swapped back in um, and then be used to bring in another tRNA. And so in this way, you're spending energy to make sure that the right tRNA gets added. Now what's going to happen, though, is that, am that amino acid tRNA is in the A site, but it's not, it needs to get added to the actual chain. And so the, now we need to have an actual peptide bond form. And this peptide bond is going to form when the amino acid tRNAs, um, the, the amino acid part of it, is actually going to attack the growing chain. So if you see in isolation, you might see like a peptide bond formation drawn something like this, where we draw it as like this condensation reaction, where basically you have the carboxyl group of one amino acid link up to the amino group of another amino acid, um, with the loss of water. So this is, although this is kind of like overall what's going to happen, it's actually going to happen in two in, in steps. And so instead of directly having the amino acid attack, um, 
the other amino acid, you're going to have this amino acid is actually going to be like a free, this amino acid is going to be bound to the tRNA. And this one is also going to be bound to the tRNA, but here, um, but this group is going to attack the, the peptide that's actually bound to the tRNA. And so in this case, this this is actually going, this OH is actually going to be lost already because the it's going to be attached to the oxygen of the tRNA. And so this is just a technical note. Um, but what so what's happening is that this part, this is already this is going to be attached through an oxygen that belongs to the tRNA. And so you're not getting it lost in this like condensation reaction happening like you would see drawn in something like this. That's just a technical note. What, so basically you get this attack and this is a nucleophilic attack, much more on this in another post. Um, but this is an example of an SN2 reaction, which I'm not going to get into here, but basically you get one thing, attack another thing. And then that other, once you've had that attack, you, that thing is now attached to too many things. And so something else gets kicked off. And so in this case, what's going to happen is we're going to get the, we're going to get what's going to get kicked off is going to be that tRNA that was holding the growing chain. So this is going to be like our leaving group. And now we have this substitution where the amino acid, the new one is attached to that chain of old ones. And all of this is attached to the tRNA in the A site. So it's gonna be something like this. The new amino acid comes in the A site, chain gets transferred. And now what? You're stuck in the A site, but we need things to be in the P site. This is going to be a really awkward situation for the ribosome because, well, the codon anticodon is kind of getting the tRNA stuck in that A site. So it's kind of like held there. But the peptide exit tunnel is coming out from like the P site. So you kind of have your chimney of the ribosome over here. And so the chain was still going through that chimney, but now it's base is that it's shifted and it's all kind of rotated and awkward. And so you're going to get another elongation factor come in and kind of help push it along. And so basically this another elongation factor, so the EEF2 in humans or EFG in bacteria, it's going to come and it's going to spend energy to push things over. And um, basically, so now you get things pushed, you have the old one pushed into that E site where it can fall off, and now your chain is held in the P site again, and you have an empty A site, which can now um, serve as the entry point for another tRNA. And so it's kind of like that, um, that song, like the monkeys in the bed, three little monkeys sitting in the bed, one came in and another one said, roll over, roll over, and they all rolled over and one fell out. That song is kind of like that, but it's happening in at this level where the incoming amino acid it gets the incoming amino acid attacks the growing chain. You get the transfer. Now things have to get pushed over. What was in the P site is now in the E site where it can go away. A new tRNA comes into the A site, and you get this going on and going on and going on. But eventually, the ribosome is going to need to stop. And so it knows how to stop because there's going to be a stop codon showing up. So this is going to be UAA, UAG, or UGA. So sometimes you might see a codon table written in the form in the like with the DNA. So it would be like TAA, TAG, or TGA. So that's the sequence that you would see in the DNA form. But in RNA, the Ts um, are actually U's. So we have a uracil instead of hamidine in RNA. And so that's why we see UAA, UAG, and UGA. And this is what the ribosome is going to see. And what the ri when the ribosome sees one of those, so when one of those shows up in the A site, what's going to happen is that there's no amino, there's no um, tRNA that actually matches that anticodon. But there is a termination factor that looks like a tRNA, um, this release factor that looks like a tRNA, um, and it can bind there and kind of like sneak in and therefore cause the release because it's not holding an amino acid, but it is have the potential to kind of like activate a water in order to attack that chain. And so we get another type of substitution reaction, but here it's coming from the water and not from the incoming amino acid tRNA. And so what's gonna happen is that you get the chain cut off and the peptide chain is going to be released. And so overall, you get this process like this. So overall, you get a process like this. This process is going to be really, really powerful and really efficient. 
um, and really, really accurate. And a lot of this accuracy comes because you're paying money up front to make sure that the right tRNA is loaded with the right amino acid. And this happens thanks to amino acid tRNA synthetases or these AARSs. Um, I have a whole post on this, um, but basically they spend ATP in order to get the right tr amino acid added onto the right tRNA. So different tRNAs with different amino acids will have different amino acid tRNA synthetases that will kind of bind to both of these and based on their shape and things like this, be able to tell, are you the right one? Are you the right one? Do you match? If so, we'll join you together. And this is really important because remember, the ribosome isn't going to know whether it's right or not, whether the amino acid part is right or not, just whether the codon and anticodon match. So that's one of the places that you'll see energy being spent. And because you're going from ATP to AMP, it's kind of like you were spending two ATP because you're gonna have to spend an ATP in order to regenerate the ADP in order to regenerate the ATP. And so it's kind of like you're costing two there. And then we're gonna spend a GTP to make sure that the right tRNA gets brought in. So that was that initial elongation factors that would be like our F2 or our EF1. And then 1A. Um, and then we have the another GTP to get things to scooch over in that ribosome. So where you're going from pushing that growing chain from the A site back to the P site where it belongs. So you free up that A site. And that was going to cost another GTP. So that was our another elongation factor. So that was like our EF, EF2 or our GF, um, EGF, EFG, sorry. And then basically, so then you have those three triphosphates, kind of four per peptide added. Then you have those, I um, mean, you know, those um, energy spending for the initiation phase, as well as for recycling the ribosome. So it's a very energetically costly process, um, but it's really, really important. And then those proteins can go and do awesome stuff all throughout the cells. So really, really cool stuff. Um, if I also, if you prefer like a more bumbly version, I have a um, I have an analogy where I think of translation kind of like a peptide series of continuous weddings between amino acids, um, where your tRNAs are kind of like limos bringing in the amino acids to be added in your ribosomal chapel. Um, and so, yeah, so if you want more on that analogy, I have, I have posts on that and um, graphics and stuff. So I will like leave you to go check out those if you want. Um, and try, I try, we just wanted to do a more normalized version um, for today. But quick review, things are gonna start off by your initiation, getting the ribosome to the right place around that start codon, which is going to be specified by that AUG and also with help from sequences in the five prime UTR and proteins binding to your cap and things like this, helping that small subunit find the right place and then bring in the large subunit. So you get the functional ribosome assembled with the, in, with the initiator tRNA in the P site. This leads open the A site um, where the incoming tRNA with the matching anticodon can come bring the corresponding amino acid. It's coming with an elongation factor that's going to help make sure that it's the right one to get added. If it sees that everything's okay, it's going to spend GTP, it's going to change shape, no longer want to bind and therefore fall off. Once it falls off, the ribosome is now free to go about its um, catalyzing this amino acid transfer. So basically the incoming tRNA, the amino acid attached to it, is going to um, attack the growing chain. The growing chain is then going to be transferred to that new um, tRNA. And so you have your chain held in the A site, which is awkward because it's coming out of the kind of like chimney that's exiting the P site. And so this really awkward formation or shape, basically things need to get scooched over. So another elongation factor is gonna come in and help um, spend some more energy, push things over, push that old tRNA into the E site where it can fall out, open up the A site for the next um, tRNA to come. All of this is going to happen until a stop codon is reached. The stop codon, it doesn't have a matching anticodon. So instead, what's going to happen is you're going to have a release factor come in. The release factor is going to come in and bind, but it doesn't have an amino acid with it. Instead, it just eggs on some water to attack. Water attacks and you get the release of the growing chain. 
And that is the overview of translation and hope you found it helpful.